Timothy chapter 2, if you will, this morning. We're going to get started um, uh, this morning and kind of pick up on something that's kind of come up over in the recent days uh, out of our study last week about government. Uh, Romans 13, we'll be back over there a little bit and uh, so forth. And th- there, there, <laughs> you know, over the years, you, you, you hear stuff and, and you, you look at different, I do anyway, I don't know about you, but you get to study and stuff out, and then you go, man, there's really no good time to kind of preach this message. So you just kind of put it on the shelf, and you, you try to put it over, and you try to sit there and go, okay, I use this one day, and so forth. And uh, this past week, we heard from our president that he was beginning to draw down the last troops out of Afghanistan. That was the plan. And to come to an end of a war that's probably the longest war we've ever been a part of, and it got me to thinking about uh, the question of should believers go to war? So we're going to look at that this week, next week, and the next, and just see what the Bible talks about war. And then on top of all of that, we, you get this, there's an underlining pen thing that says right now, you know, culturally in our society, we could have a civil war once again. And so then how do you answer that? And how do you deal with that kind of thing? and so forth. So I just wanted to spend this week, next week, and maybe the following week, probably three weeks, just kind of looking at this idea about should we go to war? Should believers be going to war? Should there be a, 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 a you know, what do you say? What does the Bible, what does the Word of God say about it? I will say this now because I'm thinking about it, but we'll look at them. You, you, you've heard of the conscious objector, obje, uh, Conscientious objectors, I get it out there. Do you know in Scripture that's against the Word of God? All of the verses that they use to say my, I'm a conscientious objector is against what the Word of God says. There's no passes, passive, there, there, there's none of that allowed. <laughs> I can't. Man, it's just, I'm, you know, you got me thinking about the boat and the pool and the skis, you know. <laughs> Passism is not allowed in the Word of God. It isn't. It's, a, it's fascinating. When you listen to them, you hear them talk about it, and then you go study the verses that they use, you go, wait a minute, that's not what that... And we're going to look at these verses as we go through the next couple weeks. We're going to look at John 18. We're going to look at Exodus here this morning. We get over there in John 18 where they, they use a verse and, and they use one in Matthew and they twist it because they don't understand the word rightly divided. And they make it say stuff it isn't saying. So now, c- can you be against war? Sure, you can be against I am. It's killing. It's taking of human life. But what does Scripture talk about? And I, I want us to have some clarity in our thinking about the subject. I want to spend some time with it. It's a very interesting study. There's roughly about eight to ten principles of war in God's Word, and I want to get them settled in our mind and in our thinking. Um, second, First Timothy 2, uh, verse number 1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. And again, we looked at this passage last week talking about government and the function of government. And the thing is, is that you and I and our relationship to government, that's really what we were talking about last week, we have a relationship with the government around us. And, and over in Romans 13, Paul lays it out and so forth. But notice that, first of all, in the local church, that's where Timothy's talking to, the first thing that happens in a local church is prayers are to be, and supplications and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. Then Paul brings in the issue specifically of for kings and for all that are in authority. Why? Why does he say, pray for these people? Well, the next word, that. There's the intent. Here's the reason. We may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. When we're thinking about our relationship with government, why are we concerned? Why do you pay attention to it? Paul did. You and I do. 
Why? That we may lead a what? Quiet and peaceable life. So that, verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The reason you're looking for a quiet and peaceable life is so you can go out and function as the ambassador for Christ. Now, you can function as the ambassador for Christ in a non-peaceful and non-quiet life. You can. That life of, and our job as ambassadors is designed to function in season and out of season. No matter where you're at, you are to preach the word. B, verse 3 and 4. That's what you're to do. But we're to be praying for the government so that, what you know, somebody emailed me during the week and they said, so who should I be voting for? Oh, how about verse number 2 again? How about vote for the candidate of your choice that's going to lead to a quiet and peaceable life? (laughs) That helps out a lot, doesn't it? It does to me. Neither one, okay. Well, there you go, all right? But the thing is, is what you have is you don't have the Word of God telling you who to vote for, but how to think about who I'm to vote for, okay? When you look at the, the election and everything that's coming, the ballots are, you know, in, in Arizona, you know, out there, and you can early vote and all that stuff. Folks, you have a great opportunity to have your voice heard in the vote. We the people vote. Boom. You can have your voice heard. Now, I know what the conspiracy people and all that stuff, but that's not the word of God. The word of God never travels in conspiracy theories. This is the truth. Here's the truth of it. And I want us to think about, I want us to have a frame of reference out of the Word of God so that when we come and look and and think about where we're living, we can have an influence in our community. We can have an influence in our state. And we can have an influence on the national level. But as we do that, we have to come from it from a divine viewpoint. Because my human viewpoint you know what, I'm ready to, let's go to Duke's, you know. Let's, you know, I'm, boom, you get fired up, don't you? You get all energized, you know, they're energizing their base and all. But, you know, when you step back and you begin to look at God's Word, you begin to look at some passages here. Come over with me to Exodus 20. You begin to look at, we're going to look at some passages here that get misunderstood, that get twisted, that get, begin to get abused. And what we're talking about specifically is in the case of war. Right now in the Internet sites, you go, look, I have. And there's, been a, there's an underpinning of a civil war brewing in this country. There is. If, if the guys on the Internet are right, you know. Well, by the way, they are right. Everything on the Internet's right, you know. You know, you know Abraham Lincoln said that, right? Okay. You know, everything on the Internet's right, right? Okay. By the way, folks on the internet and later, that's sarcasm, okay? <laughs> I get a, I get an email, I got a guy, he's like, hey, you, you said that. I'm like, dude, it's, well, I was just making a joke, man. Get over yourself. But see, the thing is, is, you know, it depends on who you read. So how do you think about that? How do you think about a, a war time here, a civil war, or going to war? How do, you, how do you think about that? Well, Exodus 20, verse 13 comes up. Exodus 20, verse 13. And the conscientious objectors and the people who want to be fat pacifists and say no war, just peace, and, and all that stuff, they use this verse quite a bit. Thou shalt not kill. And, and what that begins to do then, and by the way, is that real plain? That's real simple, isn't it? But see, the thing is, is what does that mean? What does thou shalt not kill mean? And what they do is then they begin to twist it, and they begin to say, well, that means you can't defend yourself. Come on over to Matthew 19. They, you can't defend your property. You can't defend your family. And, and, and they say, see, the, that, that good old book says, thou shalt not kill. And boy, don't you know you better be doing it. Well, you know what? When you read a verse and you want to know what a verse means, usually what's the best thing to do is go find another verse to help you understand what that verse means. See, now to me, thou shalt not kill. So I <laughs> I had the guy use that one time on me about going hunting. You shouldn't kill. I'm like, what? Huh? He goes, yeah, you can't go. I, I, you know, Jeff and I, we're out there violating the Ten Commandments. We're out there hunting. What? 
So what do you do? Go find another verse, right? Another verse to help you understand what that verse is. Matthew 19, here you go. The Lord's going to be talking here. And he says, And behold, one came and said unto him, That's the Lord, good master, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, Which? Now that's a good question. You don't tell me to keep the commandments, which one? So Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt do no what? Isn't that interesting? No murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Do you see how the Lord helped you understand what thou shalt not kill is? Thou shalt do no what? Murder. See, that clarified it. So we understand what it is, what murder is, don't we? Homicide, first degree. We're out there going and doing something that is not our that's not in our uh, authority to do. Do you remember in Romans 13? Go over there to Romans 13. Quickly, 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 quickly. Whose job was it to handle the sword? Do you remember last week we looked down there? Romans 13. Whose job was it to handle the sword? It's the government's job to execute capital punishment. Not your job. It's the government's job. Romans 13, verse 1, Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to, to the evil. What wilt thou then be, not be afraid of? That uh, I'm sorry, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou, do, if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And we went back last week. I showed you Genesis chapter 9 when Noah comes off the ark. The issue, God loves government. He's loved it since before the foundation of the world because government is designed to come in and to, and to produce and to have protection. Protection for those that are doing good and then come over and deal with the evil. We went back. I told you, this is why I did a lot of this, the evil. What is that? In Genesis over back there, he says, the evil, the violence that man has done in the earth, I'm going to destroy him, Genesis 6. So in Genesis 9, he comes off the ark, and, and, and the Lord says, okay, you got to go out there and go hunting. By the way, that's how you know it's not killing, to hunt. Because God says, do what? Go hunting. Go fishing. Hey, I like that. All right, go, let's go fish. Out, go. you got to trap them. Why? He wanted man to do what? Scatter and fill up the earth again. And then he says, listen, if you kill someone... It's blood for blood. Capital punishment is instituted. But who carries out capital punishment? Not you. The government does. So when you see people, I'm going to avenge, get my justice, my pound of flesh. No. Who does that? The government's designed to do that. Look back up in chapter 12 here. Just real quick. This kind of reminder, but going to fall into what we're talking about. So when, when we talk about killing... Chapter 12, verse 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. How are you to be living with all men? The wonderful example there. I love that verse. Live peaceably. You know what living peaceably means? That if i got to unplug you to have peace in my life, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to unplug you. If be, not being around you, if being around you causes me to be wroth, to have some anger, to be upset, what's verse 18 tell me to be? Peaceable. So guess what? I ain't going to be around you. Well, you just don't like me. No, I'm obeying the word of God right there because if I'm around you, I'm going to wring your neck and hang you from the tallest, and I'm going to be in trouble. I've committed first degree. See? You see what? But now watch verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, kill him. No, fill him. 
feed him. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be soul. Inner, inner man issue here. Who's going to take out the vengeance? Not you. It's not your job. It's not in your authority. It sits with the government. So in Scripture, there are three basic types of killing that are authorized, that are okay. One is the issue of military action, war, where you have war, killing to preserve the national interest, to preserve freedom, to preserve that which is good. Soldiers in the military, I have a quote, I think I brought it with me. I think, because I was looking at them. The object of war is not to die for your country, but make the other guy die for his. George S. Patton. What's war about, man? I'm getting shot at. What am I going to do? Think about so I'm going to shoot back. I, I like that. Make the other guy die for his. He uses a little more colorful language in that quote. but The, other, the next one is the issue of self-defense. There's legitimate issue of defending yourself to where it's not murder. Now, this is in Scripture, okay? And the third one is the issue that we've been talking about, and that's capital punishment. The execution of criminal behavior. Murder for murder. And that's the ultimate punishment. It falls under the authority of the government. That's why you pray for them. Taking of human life is not something that's just flippant. It's very serious. It's very serious in the Word of God, too. The government, you and I, we're prohibited from carrying out justice on our own. That's not war. So the principle of war, the principle of fighting in behalf of the nation, the national interest, it is moral. It's just, it's right but only when it becomes necessary to deal with the evil, the enemy, to, to rescue, and think about our country, national freedom, to rescue that from the grips of the enemy. And that whole issue of war, that again, taking of human life. Come back over to Micah, Micah 6 is something that is something that you just can't flippantly go and deal with. Over history, coming out of the 1st and 2nd century into the 3rd century, you have Rome as the military power of the day, and they are beginning to lose their hold on the world. They're beginning to lose in, in the outskirts, post, and so forth. Micah 6 and verse number 8 a verse that you, we all are familiar with, whether you know it or not. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do what? Justly. To love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. See, you, you didn't even know where that verse was, and you already know it. But you see that issue about doing justly? So there was developed a doctrine, and it's called the doctrine of the just war. And St. Augustine is the one that developed it and brought it out, and it's been developed over time. And, and he did it all based off of Romans 13, 1 to 4 there. And he begins to de and he began to think about with the use of the sword and the authority and the power of the government to go to war. And our leaders are responsible to administer justice. It's their job, it's their responsibility to go and to have just laws and just verdicts and just, and to go to war. It's their job. You know what our responsibility is? Support those leaders as they do that. Pray for them. Support. It's interesting to me in Paul, when Paul was interacting with Agrippa and Festus and Felix, and I think about Festus and I think of the Adams family, you know. <sighs> yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Oh, it's where, okay. You know, the, the hand. And, oh, all right, it's all right. You know, it's, you know, the whole thing. But when you think about Paul, you know, ne Paul never, I shouldn't say never. 
Only one time did Paul object to the way he was being treated by the Roman government. And that's when they beat on him and he reminded them he, he was a Roman soul citizen. Other than that, he never objected to it. Because Paul is teaching us, we, te we understand. Do, do we not understand the end of the story? <laughs> when the Lord comes back, he's going to do what? He's going to make war that's going to end all wars. He is. He's going to come back in Revelation 19, and it's a war. It's a blood fest. But he's coming back in the authority of what? His kingdom. He's the king. So St. Augustine developed basically seven tenets of the just war. And I, I said this morning, I have all this stuff and trying to bring. So I narrowed it. I got it down, okay? Instead of sitting up here reading volumes of, and so forth. And you will have, there are two, Augustine identified two aspects of war that required moral justification and guidelines. The first was the right to go war, uh, jus ad bellum, B-E-L-L-U-M, J-U-S, then A-D, and then bellum. And then the second one was the right sorts of conduct in war. And that was just in bello, B-E-L-L-O, whoo i got a little Latin for you this morning. I don't know what Latin. I'm just reading English. And he says, in the first part, the right to go war, go to war, concerns the justification that a nation must give in order for it to have the moral right to wage war on another. Augustine laid the basis in four main criteria. One, just authority. Is the decision to go to war based on a legitimate political and legal process? Is it a do we have authority to do this? Number two, just cause. Has a wrong been committed to which war is the only and appropriate response? Right intention. Is the response proportional to the cause? In other words, is the war action limited to righting the wrong and no further? And again, when people speak of mission status, this condition is the relevant concern. Number four, last resort. Has every other means of righting the wrong been attempted sincerely so that no other option but war remains? In other words, have we gone through the backdoor channels and worked this thing out? Okay. And if the answer to that last one is yes, and it's time to go to war. Then you have the conduct of war. And this is where the moral concern creeps in because this is where, number one, proportionally. The, the proportionality of the use of force in a war. The degree of allowable force used in the war must be measured against the force required to correct the just cause and limited by just intentions. In other words, do we go drop another atom bomb on them or not? What is it? Number two, discrimination. The, combat, the combatants discriminate between combatants and non Combatant, innocent, non-military people should never be made the target of attacks. There's your collateral damage. Now we've got, how many times have we seen over the years where the news media will put up and, oh, these citizens were bombed by whatever. And what does that do? It begins to tug at you to say what? No more war. Then you have the issue of responsibility country is not responsible for unexpected side effects of its military activity as long as the following three conditions are met. The action must carry the intent to produce good consequence, the bad effects were not intended, and the good of the war must outweigh the damage done by it. And what you begin to have there is you begin to have what is called the just war and those impacts. Now, what is interesting is when we come to Scripture, a majority of that is scriptural. There's a few of them that aren't, but a majority of them is. So when you begin to talk about and think about it, and that's what Augustus did, Augustus, Augustine did, was he went in and looked at Romans 13, and he began to develop out and to look at what's the government to do. 
Well, Romans 13, what is a government to do? Support the good and bind up and defeat and defend against the evil, the violence of men. Come back with me to Genesis 14. So I put Augustine aside and uh, went back to Scripture to begin to look at some principles of war that are in Scripture and begin to think about some, some things about war and about fighting and about going and doing. And again, you can, I said it in the beginning, the issue of being conscientious objection and no, I'm not doing it is not in Scripture. Okay? We're going to war. These are why, this is the parameters. These are some principles here. The first principle that you find in Scripture is that war will always exist in time. It's a sad fact of fate, of, of life. But war is always going to be there, and it's always going to be between nations. There's never been a time on this planet, Earth, ever that there hasn't been a war going on. Genesis 14, verse 1. And it, became, it came to pass in the days of all those guys. See them? Verse 2. That these made what? There's your first war in the Bible right there. Genesis 14. Verse 3. And these were joined together in the, in the vow of Siddim, which is the salt sea. Twelve years they served. You see that joined together? There's your first league of nations right there. Genesis 9. Noah comes off the boat. The Lord gives the ark, the Lord gives him his commander to scatter. What happens in Genesis 10? You see the establishment of nations, don't you? The national, the borders and the people and the language and all that. Genesis 11, the confounding of the language. By the way, Genesis 11 shows you and tells you what globalism and internationalism was going to get you. Trouble, heartache. The earth, everything was created so that na sovereignty of nations existed. So that they could do what? Bind up the evil. Promote the good. Listen, folks, if, if you're sitting in a country outside of the United States of America and you're tormented day and night about what you believe, what will you eventually start looking for? A place to go to that won't do that to you. The wonderful thing about the founding of this country that gets lost on the masses out there is that the founding of this country is a byproduct of the Protestant Reformation. Because the pilgrims, when they, by the way, November... I think it's 11th, 1620, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. 400 years ago, they landed over there. And you know why those guys took off? Because they were lollards and they, were, they, were, they had a belief in, about Christ and so forth. Very Calvinistic too, by the way, just FYI. But you know what they did? They were tired of being persecuted by the Church of England. So they got on a boat. By the way, they brought with them a Geneva Bible. Interesting, forerunner to the King James Bible. They brought it on over. They come on. You know what they were looking for? Not being persecuted on a daily basis. And a whole bunch of other things, too, by the way. Okay? But that was one of them. So when you think about what's happening here, war is always going to be there. When they got off, anyway, I'd get out of the history, okay? Now, come over with you to Matthew chapter 24. I told myself, stay on point, stay on point, stay on point. <laughs> Go slow. Stay on point. <laughs> come to Matthew 24. So, the first war in the Bible is between the nations. Genesis back there, the 10, the nations are set up. Oh, I know what it was I was talking about. Genesis 11, Satan introduces internationalism. The four institutions that God created. On creation, volition, fa marriage, family. He then creates nationalism, Genesis 10, so that he, they can protect those three institutions. That's the good. Satan says, all right, I'll deal with this. First of all, he attacked man's volition. Yea, hath God said. God really didn't say what he said, so you need to think, you know, do this. Then he went over and attacked marriage, and he got Eve to usurp Adam as her head, as her husband. Then he goes over and he attacks the family, gets Cain to kill Abel. So now all of society is in an uproar because those fundamental tenets are being 
uprooted underneath the satanic attack. So you know what he does? He says, I can get this nationalism thing done right now. We'll just make everybody one language, and we'll get them all together and create globalism, internationalism. God says, no, you don't, and confounds the language, and off they go. Acts chapter 2, with the speaking in tongues gift given, reverses that. Why? Because the nation of Israel, Genesis 12, Abraham's called out. Israel's established God's nation. They have to go out and deal with all the nations now. So they've got to be able to speak the different languages. Follow that? Too? Now, we're in the age of grace. But look at this issue about war. It's, the first thing you've got to know is war is always going to be there. Matthew 24, verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? What do they want to know? What's the end going to look like? How are we going to know when this is all said and done? Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of, notice now, wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For na so what are they going to hear? Wars and what? Rumors of wars. War started in the beginning. Guess what it's going to be doing at the end? Still clicking. Verse 7, for, the na for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places, all different places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Isn't that interesting? So you know what the Lord says? It started with the war, Genesis 14, and it's going to end with the war. Revelation 19 is going to be him, the end of the story. So the question is, is okay, War is always going to exist. Come on over to James 4. Why, then, does it exist? In spite of all of the attempts to stop war, why does it continue? Why does it operate? Some will say that war is caused because of poverty. Some will say it's because of an injustice. Some will say it's because of a rising up against the power structure. Some say war is just based on pure blame ignorance. They don't know any better. Well, James 4 helps you a little bit, I believe. 4 verse 1. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Now, isn't that our question? Where does the war come from? James 4 1. Where does it come from? Why do siblings fight? Why do children fight? Why do parents fight? Why do families fight? Why do neighbors fight? Why does all of this happen? From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill, kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war. Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. You know why there's fighting? Sin. That's why there's fighting. The lust in your... That's the problem. The thing that wars in your members, he says. That desire to have something that ain't yours, and you're just going to be the bully and go take it. There's something in the nature of man that causes war. Not just poverty, by the way. There have been people in poverty that have lived peaceably and lived long lives without ever going to war. There's people who have lived under the oppression of, power, of government that have lived peaceably and never gone to war. It's interesting. It's very fascinating to me. Yet there's something more and that's the issue of the lust of your flesh, sin. Come over to Revelation chapter 20. By the way, who is the only one that can change the nature of men? Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you take the Lord Jesus Christ and He becomes you, 
He gives you a new life. He makes you a new creature. He changes that. Then guess what begins to happen? Well, this issue about war takes on a different viewpoint, a different objection, objective. Roman, uh, Revelation 20, verse 1. In Revelation 20, by the way, Revelation 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make what? War. <laughs> the last war, the war to end them all. But then 20, chapter 20, something happens. And I saw in heaven, I'm sorry, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. What does God do there? What is the, he comes in and he binds up Satan, doesn't he? And he does it for the thousand years, that intro to the kingdom of God, a kingdom of heaven. Here it is, intro period. But he does it for a reason. What did Eve say in Genesis 3 when God said, what would you do, Eve? What would she say? You remember? The devil made me do it. <laughs> Satan said, the woman you gave me made me do it. Eve says, no, the devil made me do it. Follow that? She, they set into the nature of man passing the buck mentality. God loves government. He loves accountability, too. And what did man do now? Ah, it's, they, they're the ones. Lincoln made a comment about the start of the Civil War that we would not be the, the North would not be the first to fire the shot. The South would be. And he was right. The South did. But it was after much provoking of the North. But he, didn't, he wanted to be able to say what? They started it. We're going to finish it. That's what he wanted when you read the, the, the history. What did Satan? What is God doing with Satan? A thousand years he's bound up so that man could not say what? The devil made me do it. But rather that man would come to understand that sin was their problem. And that lust in their members was their problem. Not the devil, but they were the problem inside of them. Because watch what happens, verse 7. You guys with me? See what we're doing here? Verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. And the number of whom he found was no one because they all repented and turned to... No, what did he find? He find the number of them as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven, uh, from God out of heaven and devoured them. What did man do? Went right back to war. Satan hasn't been on the scene a thousand years. He's back on. He revs up the program again. And what does man do? Okay, 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 okay. Let's go, let's go, let's go. They've compassed the city. They've surrounded Jerusalem again. They're ready to come in and attack. And God says, enough of this, and hits the big lighter and goes, gets them. You know, a little blowtorch on them. By the way, you see a great picture of that with Elijah and the battle of the Baal over there. And it consumes them. But what did man do? Man didn't learn his lesson. Man went right back. Now think about where we're at, Revelation 20. We're where? We're in the kingdom. Who is sitting on the throne in the kingdom? The Lord Jesus Christ is. Perfect justice. No justice, no peace. No, perfect justice. Perfect righteousness. Perfect installation of the law. If you're guilty, you're guilty. If you're innocent, you're, you will never be there to begin with. Perfect, righteous justice. Yet what did man still do? He went to war. So when you hear these people say, oh, no justice, no peace, and blah, 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 they only have one thing in their heart. And that's violence. It's war. The only person who can change your nature, folks, is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
where He works that new life and that new nature in you. And that then causes and brings up the greatest defense against war in a nation is the amount of sound doctrine out of the Word of God rightly divided that's resident in the citizenship of that nation, in the people of that nation. You know what comes up? Hey, ever think about World War II? I do. I don't know why, but I, 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 I read the books, I watch the movies, you pay attention to the documentaries. And why was there such a burning backing to avenge Pearl Harbor, to go get the axes, nail them, be done with them? Why was there such a welling of national pride, never seen before? Because there was, a, there was a component in this country that had an influence on the morality of this nation from the Word of God, rightly divided, that said we defend the national interest and we go to war. Follow that. You see, folks, unbelievers and believers in a nation have an impact on the morality condition in that nation. The believer, think about you and I. The restraint of you and I to instantly go to war. The hold back of that, why? Because we value what? We value life, don't we? For the internet, they're all shaking their head yes. <laughs> a little worried there for a minute. No, we value life, don't we? The restraint of the believer who's going to walk by faith in an intelligent understanding of God's word rightly divided. You will have an impact on the cultural around us. That's why today, the trouble you see today, the violence you see today, there's no slowing it down, there's no curtailing it, there's no refrain against it. You know why? Because the church, the body of Christ as a whole, has failed at its job. They've left the King James Bible, they have left the Apostle Paul as their apostle, and the doctrines given to him, to you and I, and they have moved away from dispensationalism. So then guess what's crept back in? Modernist, liberals, ideas, humanism, the Old Testament. I, and that's where you get over there in those passages where eye for eye and tooth for tooth, let's go. And you go read that and that ain't not what the Lord's talking about. War's always going to be there, folks. It's always going to exist. You and I have an opportunity to influence. Now, where can we influence? where we are, <laughs> right? And we should have that influence. Second point, come back with me to Micah, chapter 3. Micah, Micah went to church today. Micah 3. So number one, war is always going to exist. Point number two, the peace propaganda that you see and hear is really a weapon of warfare. Okay? When they cry peace, sudden destruction comes. We'll look at that in 1 Thessalonians 5 in just a minute. You see, folks, the cry for peace and the peace policies and the peace processes is just simply propaganda to go to war for warfare. Micah 3. We're going to jump in here. Micah 3, verse number 5. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err. So are these good guys or bad guys? They're bad guys, okay? All right? That bite with their teeth and cry what? See how they're, they're crying what? Peace. And he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare what? War against him. They're over here crying peace, and what are they doing over here? Getting ready for war. Peace. Look over here. Don't look over there. Peace over here. Don't look over there. Are you looking over here? Right, peace. We're for peace. Don't look over there. Peace. You know. Therefore, night shall be unto you, that ye shall 
not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you that ye shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. You know what? They're out there crying peace and preparing war, and they don't understand what they're doing. They have no light from the Lord on the matter. They have forsaken him, by the way. They've gone, they've, they've taken Israel against God. Verse 7. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. When they cry peace, and they begin to promote peace, what it does is it pulls. It takes away the courage to go to the battlefield. You think about that. You think about Vietnam. You think about Korea. What was going on in this country? Not on the battlefield. What were they crying for? Peace. What was it doing to the guys on the battlefield? Forget the politics and all that. But what was it doing to them? demoralizing them, bringing them down, had no desire to go fight. Thus the question, why are we here, was popular. What are we doing? Why? Because at home, the country that's supposed to have been behind them and support, what are they crying? Peace. What were the politicians crying? Peace. And what were they doing? Pushing the war. It just demoralized the nation. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 8 says in that verse there's a time for war and there's a time for peace. There's a time for love and all the other in the rest of that verse. You see, there's time for peace, yes. There's time to go over and work out the differences and, and get them worked down, yes. But there comes a time when that isn't going to work and guess what we have to do? Go to war. Come over to Psalms 55. Psalms 55. I'm going, I'm going to get going. Psalms 55. Almost done. Psalms 55. <clears throat> Again, folks, I just, in my heart's desire is just so you kind of think about this. I'm not saying we go out tomorrow and go to war. I'm just saying think about this. Because there's going to be some things that are going to come up in the next year or two, depending on what happens November 3rd, maybe even a couple months that you and I are going to have to sit and we're going to have to look at and we're going to have to strongly consider how we're going to respond to it. We have to. One of them is going to be the issue of a civil war. The other one's going to be the issue of mandatory vaccinations and what you decide to allow done to your body. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks, okay? Look at Psalms 55. Verse 20, because here's the ultimate guy. Here's the ultimate peace propagandist. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. Isaiah 30, referencing this, says we're talking about the Antichrist, the one, the main guy. But war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn what? Swords. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. What's going on? Verse 20, he hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. What's the Antichrist going to do? He's going to swoop in at the last moment with a peace policy, and he's going to save Israel from the fight of their life with Egypt. Go read Daniel 10, 11, what's going on there. And he's going to come in, and he's going to say, if you sign the agreement, Isaiah says they signed the covenant with death and hell. Woo! By the way, the last horse in Revelation 6 is a death and hell horse. They had an agreement. They're in a league with him. They're in a con confederate with him. And he's sitting over here going, peace, baby, peace. And he's pushing the war over here. And Israel falls for it. Because they, you know what they want? 
They want peace. But what do they get? War. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, those guys begin to describe what the Antichrist does. And you know what? You think Israel's rich today. You wait till he gets his hands on them. They will be living off of the fat of the land. He's going to go up there. He's going to take the royal mount, the Mount Holy over there, whatever they call it. He's going to wipe them all, all those religions off of there, and he's going to rebuild the temple. And you know what Israel's going to do? Okay, okay, okay. And they're going to follow him. And the believers are going to sit there and say, No, don't go back over there. We go to the new covenant. We don't go to the old. No, don't, don't do it. And they're going to take him. You know what he's going to cry? Peace. Isaiah describes them as the, fat, the firstlings of the land and the fatness of the land. And then all of a sudden, he's going to look in there and he's going to say, no more. War. Matthew calls it the great tribulation that no man's... And you know what he does? He yanks the peace out from underneath them and he starts killing them. 1 Thessalonians 5. Got to understand where this... By the way, where is this coming from? Sin, baby, sin. The nature of man. 1 Thessalonians 5. Peace can never be achieved by coexistence or appeasement. And that's what they want. So number one, war. It's, it's, it's always there. And number two, the peace propaganda is just a mechanism of warfare. 1 Thessalonians 5 Paul talking to us, he says, Of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. What do they say? Peace! But what's really coming? Destruction. And peace is used as a weapon of warfare to kill the courage for the battle. That's what's happening. So we're going to continue to kind of look at it. Because what I'm, again, we have to recognize that when war comes, where does it come from? How do we think about it? How do we contemplate it? Maybe you've never thought about it. Maybe, okay, I'll give you something new to think about. At the time that warfare comes, it can be restrained by the consciousness of the citizens as long as they're impacted by sound doctrine. Or it can be restrained by the use of force. Robert E. Lee said, It is well that war is so terrible, otherwise we should grow too fond of it. And he's right. War is hell. You talk to veterans that have been through, I'm not talking about in the back end on the country club side of it, I'm talking about in it. Most of the time, all of the time, the only way to maintain national freedom is to be ready to pay the price required to maintain that liberty and that justice. And that's usually done in a war. When evil is dealt with and the good is promoted. And you go and you constrain it. Now, we're going to pick up, we're going to continue looking at the issues here because I only gave you two this morning, <laughs> okay? But you need to pay attention to what's happening because this is going to be very subtle on our system this time around because it's going to be interior, internal. Follow that? All right. Something to think about. Something to consider. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we just thank you for who we are in your Son. We thank you that even though times may seem out of whack and desperate for us, yet for you... It is already accomplished that we'll be seated in the heavenly places with you. And Lord, I just pray that we don't take our eyes off of who we are in you, that we go live our lives as your ambassadors, be a voice of reason in a very unreasonable scenario, 
coming to consider these things from your word, have them impact us because they are your word and your thinking about the issues. And give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In your name we pray. Amen.